Hello and welcome to Pods Like Us. I'm Martin Quibble, known to my friends as Marv, and with me today is radio presenter and host of the shows uh, Bob Dylan Album by Album and Long Player, Mr. Ben Burrell. How are Hi. you, Ben? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. That's okay, no problem. So, radio presenting, how did you get most people's dream job by being a radio presenter then? <laughs> Is it most people's dream job? Um, it was certainly my dream job for a long time. Um, I went to university, um, uh, not particularly to get a degree. And uh, in my first week, I came across the student radio station there. And actually, before I went, I sort of had a little interest in it because I found out there was a student radio station there. And uh, I joined that. And um, uh, I won a competition in my final year at university. So after three years of doing like student radio, um, and as I won that competition, I was walking home and I suddenly thought, oh, maybe I could do this as a career. And I just sort of pursued it and um, started out the very bottom on a radio station that had uh, about six listeners. And um, now I'm on the station I used to listen to when I was younger and a station that I love called Absolute Radio, which um, is, is lots of fun. It's a great place to work. Okay. So on Absolute Radio, do you, just, do you just do the Absolute Radio or are you on any of the other affiliated, like the 80s or the 90s ones? Because <laughs> yes. I know that they do all the others. Yes. We have lots of them. We, have a, we, have, we call them a family of stations, uh, Martin. Oh. It's, it's almost like you're my boss. You're selling the station. <laughs> um, we have, uh, I love it. He'll love this. Um, uh, you have lots of different stations and I'm on the uh, 90 station in the mornings and the uh, main Absolute Radio station in the afternoons. Okay. So from there then, how did you uh, get to know about podcasting, get involved in podcasting? Um, well, I mean, uh, it was sort of everywhere. I mean, it's everywhere now, but it was it was um, everywhere about three or four years ago too, um, certainly within like the radio community. And um, I used to tear my hair out at people just thinking they could start a podcast because audio is such a, it's, it's a difficult medium to get right unless you one listen to a lot of podcasts or you or you know kind of audio or two your your radio person i mean obviously people do get it right if they're not like you know big personalities or whatever um but i used to get a, a disappointed at some potential podcasts that weren't recorded like properly or in the right quality um so i i said to friends of mine that were in the radio industry as well like we should be doing this because we know how audio works this this should be what something we're doing um, and uh, some people did and some people didn't, and I just ended up starting a podcast. That, that is a strange thing, actually, because podcasts have been going on for a while, and then it's only recently that you've actually found radio stations going into that world. Don't, don't get me started. I mean, we, we, <laughs> we had this discussion uh, years ago, and it was, it was disappointing that it's taken radio so long to get into podcasting because um, it's, as I said, it's the kind of perfect medium. If you, if you work in radio and you have worked in radio for a long time, then you know audio and you know how it works. You know, just, you know, because you've done it so much, you, you know what, what's, what works and what doesn't work and, and what fails and, and what kind of makes the audio good. Um, so it's quite frustrating that radio took a long time to get involved, but it, it now seems that it's like a gold rush era. Um, I think <laughs> people might have missed the boat, <laughs> but who knows? Uh, but thankfully, in this current era, um, there's some really good podcasts out there, which is great to see because um, audio is an amazing medium. It's my favourite medium. I think it's, it's an undervalued medium at times. I've, I've got to agree with you on that. I used to work in a recording studio, so there you go. Oh, um, I bet the story, I bet you've got some stories. No, not really famous oh. people go into them. So it's just a small ish recording studio that they had in a uh, in a youth club in Mansfield oh, nice. back in the day. Oh, very nice. Um so it was part of the Nottinghamshire Youth Arts um council led uh, movement that they've got there. So um oh, I see, uh, right. Um we well, yeah, I think audio, I don't know, I think for me and I, I know other people feel this as well, but it's it's such a personal medium. I mean, especially as a as a presenter on radio, you're taught to kind of talk to one person, whereas TV is kind of like a, a broad medium of of kind of you know we're putting on a show for you. Whereas radio and, and audio, especially podcasts, it feels certainly much more intimate and like you are you're, you're talking directly to one other person. And um, I, I love that medium for it, and that's that's kind of another reason why I started a podcast because you can be even more intimate on a podcast than you can on a, on a radio station. Yeah, um, yeah. I've always thought radio is a nice thing. It's it's almost like you're doing other things, but it's like the radio presenter is the person that's there as your company while you're doing other things. And 
Yeah. Yeah. And the texts and, and tweets we get um, as a presenter is, you know, you, they're, they're from kind of people that consider you friends, which is, you know, the biggest compliment you can get, really. Um, I'm not sure you would get quite the same thing if you were uh, kind of a, a low level TV presenter. Maybe you would. I don't know. But um, it certainly doesn't feel that way. Yeah, that's true. So anyway, let's uh, let's go to um, the podcast itself. How did you um, how did the idea of the podcast uh, about Bob Dylan come into uh, come into being? Um, well, I, um, I am, I guess it's a slightly, um, completest nature. I love to look at, um, people's entire kind of bodies of work. I always really like to, to get like a favorite director, um, or a favorite, uh, singer and, and, uh, see their kind of body of work as a whole. So I've always been obsessed with kind of like people's discography or, or their filmography or whatever. Um, and obviously I'm a big fan of Bob Dylan. He's my kind of favorite uh, songwriter ever. Um, and uh, there was uh, various books that were out of, you know, kind of doing each album in turn or each song in turn. And I just thought that would work perfectly as a podcast. It's, it's kind of, there's something about it because it's not always looking at just the famous songs or the famous albums. There is kind of like scope with it. You can look at, why albums didn't work and, and periods of, of uh, his, or especially Dylan's career, where things were not quite as good as maybe they could have been. Um, so yeah, I was, I was literally in the shower one day when I suddenly twigged um, in a classic shower thought, I suddenly thought that would work as a podcast. Um, Cause I just spent, I used to, this is quite sad, Martin. I used to spend hours uh, when I was like cleaning my teeth or um, uh, in the shower every single day, just thinking about my favorite Bob Dylan albums and, and why some were better than others in my opinion. So I suddenly thought it's time, it's time to make that into a podcast. I don't think that's sad at all. I think <laughs> I, th- I thought I thought everybody did that about artists that they like. Oh, good. That's good to hear. Really, <laughs> I know I've certainly thought that about you know different Beatles and Queen albums and Bob Dylan as well. I, I, I mean, I guess that's essentially what it is. It's me. It's me taking that internal monologue, thinking too much about uh, music, and, and just putting it onto a podcast. Okay, but the, so the things that. Um, that you were reading then you were lo- looking at the they were looking at the albums in chronological order mm. so but but you look at the albums in a more random less linear fashion yeah i i mean i start the I, the first episode i put out was um on an album called oh mercy which um and the reason why i did that is because i felt people that didn't really know dylan would, would love that album even though it doesn't often crop up on those kind of best bob dylan album lists towards the top um so I started with that just purely because I wanted to do an episode on it and I, and I wanted to test it out. Um, and also the reason why I didn't do it chronologically is because I just felt like by the time by the time you get to the late 80s, early 90s, there's going to be like six episodes in a row where everyone's like, God, this is awful. <laughs> it's just never ending awfulness. <laughs> um, so I thought, and also you don't, you don't want to waste all the 60s albums in one go. Um, so I thought for the longevity of the podcast, I probably shouldn't do it chronologically. <laughs> That's true, but and, and like you said, I mean, uh, in with that, you'd have you'd have albums where the, the absolute stone cold classics, and then you'll go to something that's not <laughs> you, you go from one extreme to the other because yeah, the thing the thing about Bob is that he he never stays in one place for a long time. He always likes to keep moving, even though people have this thing of him being a specific type of artist. Mm. Yeah, I think, and that's the other thing as well. I think it, I, I really wanted to show his career and, and I thought it's quite interesting to see um, one particular album compared to another. Um, like, for example, um, a lot of albums share themes and, and a lot of albums are are completely different. And I thought doing episodes side by side like that would show that comparison and, and really kind of bring it out. And it's fascinating to see kind of um, a, an album like, uh, you know, um, uh, like Highway 61 Revisited, say, compared to like yeah. um, Empire Burlesque. That it, it's, it's strange that the same person would have produced those two albums. And, and in, on one album, he's kind of making this incredible music and, and this kind of era-defining music. And on the, on the other, he just sounds bored and he's just completely got no, like, um, he's not invested in it whatsoever. Um, so I thought but doing it that way, kind of non-chronologically, it's quite interesting to see that comparison. I hope anyway. <laughs> yeah. And at the same time, you've also got an artist who um, you, c- you could have two classic albums uh, that are from different periods that are so completely different musically, but they are great albums. Like you'll have the, the most recent one, which is, I think it's a really good album, the newest mm. album. Yeah. Um, 
and but that's so different to things like the times they are changing back in the 60s so it's almost like the different people in a way yeah definitely and i think it's frustrating sometimes because i think as you kind of alluded to earlier it's people feel like bob dylan's just that kind of scrawny kid that's a singer songwriter with a guitar writing folk songs but yeah. I don't think he's, he's not really written folk songs for decades. I mean, I, you know, we're getting into sort of classing of genres and, and maybe that's not true, but he hasn't kind of had that acoustic guitar and, and just himself on stage for so long now. And people still have that image of him. And, and of course, that's his kind of uh, his kind of caricature identity, I guess. Um, but he really has kind of had all these different eras in his career and all these different sounds that people just don't really realise if you're not a Bob Dylan fan. And people talk about David Bowie kind of transforming his sound and playing these characters. And Dylan, I don't think, did it quite as specifically as that. Um, but he certainly is is one of the artists that that really did change from album to album and era to era. Um, and people just don't think about it. I mean, you know, in the 80s, there was kind of, kind of reggae overtones in his music. Um, in the 90s, there was, the, you know, the incredible kind of Daniel Lanois sound at the, and at the back of the 80s as well. And uh, now on this that latest album, Rough and Rowdy Ways, I just think it's, got, it's a completely different sound again. And, and as you say, I think it's a, it's a classic record, the latest one. And um, I don't think people have made enough of the fact that he can have a song like Murder Most Foul, which is just an incredible sounding song and sounds nothing like he's done before, but they don't really mention it because it's, it's Bob Dylan and it's not someone like David Bowie. That, that's true. Yes. So, so what research and resources do you use for your program? Oh, I mean, that's the bit I find quite frustrating sometimes um, because there's, there's a wealth of material online. I mean, I will just literally start and, and Google the album because that's I always think a good way to start. Uh, Wikipedia as well. I mean, I think you need to have the kind of facts down, um, the sort of when was it recorded, how long did it take to record, all that. Um, and I sort of go from there. Um, I don't, again, it's because there's such a wealth of material, it's quite difficult to get... Um, get your own ideas clear in your mind otherwise you do get persuaded quite easily by people's opinions and i think that often leads to a bit of a, a muddied kind of um, explanation of the album um so whilst there's a lot of kind of base research i also try and sit down and work out what i feel about the album just by listening to it um and it's quite interesting actually because i think a lot of his albums do have a theme to them they have a feeling to them and, and whether or not that, that's a conscious decision i don't know but um an album like shadows in the night for example which is a covers record of yeah. like american standards uh that despite the fact it is a covers album has such a strong identity it's, it's such a kind of late night crooners album um so i will try and sit and work out the theme of the album and work back from there and see if the songs and their meanings and the lyrics fit with that or not um but yeah, as I say, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one because there's just so much stuff out there and so much opinion because he's such a widely discussed artist. Um, but I give it my best shot. Talking about themes, recently on that episode you were on about um, self-portrait and, and you mentioned there about, about themes through that album. I've not really thought about that. I just thought of it as an album of songs that he just felt like doing at the time. But you, yeah. you seem to find something there that was that I'd not realised before then, even as a listener who's who's listened to Bob so much over the years as well. Yeah, well, I think, again, another covers album. And you, as you say, like on First Thought, and I, I didn't, I, I put off doing that one because I thought, well, there's nothing really there to discuss. But actually, when you listen to it and when you kind of immerse yourself in it, it's quite an interesting album. It's, it's nowhere near my favourite album. But um, no. yeah, it's a, fun, it's a funny kind of almost quite rebellious album in that he's just literally doing what he wants. He's kind of pushing the self-destruct button and and also at the same time creating a kind of uh, as the title suggests self-portrait of you know this is what i'm about these are these songs these are the, the songs rather that i like and uh here's some live cuts of mine so it's quite an interesting kind of like um uh what's the right word like a collage i guess of, of like him and his career um again whether that was a conscious decision i don't know i, I probably doubt it but it certainly comes across as that yeah i think that and, and all the episodes that you do we'll, we'll go back to to, to this as well where um when you've done all the research and the resources that you've used th there's something really good about your about your, your show where you you keep it compact so it's not a very long show and drawn out like some shows could be or it could be but at the same time it's got all the information that's needed so how do you structure the episodes to be able to be that length while getting everything in there that you need to um well that's that's very kind i mean um do you know it's it's funny you say that actually i literally on the way here got an email quite an angry, and this this hardly ever happens but i think i've had like two or three in, in the entire time i've been doing the podcast an angry email from someone saying that um 
uh, that we don't go into a, a, enough depth or it, it's, we only skim the surface and blah, blah, blah. Um, but my kind of reply to that is that I think when I first started out the podcast, it was I made a real decision that it was going to be a, a podcast for people like me, people who like Dylan, but maybe didn't know a lot about him, really, like liked the albums, had some favorites, didn't know some of the albums. Um, wasn't like a, a complete and utter Dylan fanatic. I mean, I, I love him, but I didn't know every single thing about him and I still don't know to this day. No. Um, but I, I, I thought a podcast for those people would be best. People that are interested in Dylan and want to find out more, not a podcast for people that want to, that know most of it and want to kind of analyze every single lyric. Um, so yeah, I decided that the episodes were going to be sort of half an hour and uh, under that, hopefully sort of 20 minutes, half an hour, a kind of overall general view of the albums rather than specific songs. Um, and again, going back to what I said before, like the themes of the albums and, and what what the kind of point of that album was and why it didn't work or why it did work. Um, recently, the albums have got a little bit, um, uh, the, the, albums, the episodes got a little bit longer, um, in, including the, uh, the uh, Rough and Rowdy Ways episode was almost an hour long. Um, but again, I think keeping it under an hour is, is sort of okay these days. Um, and that album particularly had a lot to discuss because obviously it's a new release and, and it's his first release for a long time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I try and, it's, again, it's quite a difficult balancing act. You try and kind of incorporate everything that you need to with the album without going into unbelievably boring minutiae detail <laughs> because I think that will put some more casual fans off. And also it just, you end up get, going into the weeds a little bit. I think if you analyse every single lyric, then it's it's a it's a thankless task because you're never going to get anywhere because I, that's not how art works it's it's not always in the specifics it's sometimes just in the kind of general feel well, well i think so anyway so so do i i think there's a tendency or this possibility of over over analyzing a subject and 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 really even with all types of art you've got to have that little bit of magic that you're not quite sure about so you don't want to an, over analyze it and make make the art uh, sort of anodyne yeah I, com- yeah I completely agree and um it's funny actually because i there's a couple of albums i've done on the podcast where i can't really listen to them much now because i feel like i um they become a bit mechanical in my head and I, I know too much about them um thankfully that doesn't happen for the majority of the albums um but i agree i think once you if you over analyze something you you kind of lose that magic um it's a bit like um i i love dylan's lyrics because they feel like that they're so kind of ambiguous at times that you don't quite, you, you're almost, there's a, you're almost kind of almost guessing what they are. It, you're never quite hundred percent sure, which is the best bit about them because there is that kind of magic. Um, and I feel if you overanalyze that, then as, as you say, you, you lose that. And that's, that's the whole reason why you came there in the first place. That's true. How were you introduced to uh, Bob in the first place? Oh, my dad. My dad's a big Bob Dylan fan and my mum too, but my dad more so. Um, and um, these songs for me are like nursery rhymes. I can't remember a time when um, I didn't know a Bob Dylan song. Um, we used to, um, we, we moved around quite a bit when I was young and uh, we used to kind of have long car journeys around the country to go and see friends or family members that were in like the previous place we lived. Um, so quite a few weekends would be spent for like in the car for two or three hours. Um, and we'd we'd listen to Bob Dylan CDs Um and, and bless my dad, he wouldn't often play the big albums. It would be um, maybe compilation CDs like Biograph. Um, so I get introduced to songs like Blind Willie McTell and um, Changing of the Guards and uh, Up To Me and songs like that that aren't necessarily Dylan's biggest. But um, but yeah, they, they were great. It's a great kind of education. Um, and by the time it came to my teenage years, um, I was living at home and I walked downstairs one day and my dad was watching, I think he was watching Don't Look Back. I'm sure it was Don't Look Back. Um, and I saw Dylan on TV and obviously I knew the songs, but I wasn't particularly interested in him at that point. Um, and I saw him on TV at one of those press conferences that he did um, in England on that tour. And um, I just, I thought he was so funny and he was the smartest person by far in the room. And he was kind of being quite ob- obnoxious and um, quite sarcastic, which I loved. And I just thought, who is this guy? And and how come he's he's like ten, he's he's like ten minutes in front of everyone else. He 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 knows what they're going to say, and he's already got a witty answer. Um, so yeah, I was really drawn in by him. And I, I said to my dad, "Oh, can I listen to some more Bob Dylan?" And he gave me the the Biograph CD, and uh, it went from there really. Yes, that don't look back. It, it's funny because he's there and he's saying things, and it's almost like 
he's saying things that are really funny, but nobody realises Yes, he's taking the mickey out of them. It's so straight. It's, it's almost like it's been scripted. It's like a, it's like a Ricky Gervais uh, comedy because it's like, as you say, like no one reacts. And it's so, it's so puzzling. I think it's because he was, you know, obviously this kid from New York and, and Britain still at that point was very kind of um, stiff upper lip and, and very kind of, I don't know, everyone seems like emotionally dead, don't they? <laughs> they can't, they can't crack a smile and they can't, they can't even engage him with a conversation because he's just so far removed from what they're doing. Um, yeah, that was that was a big deal for me watching that. And I, I still get that feeling when I watch it. It's kind of like a, an excitement of watching him at that age just b- behaving like that because it's so different. And, and, and you can just tell he's going to be a, a massive, massive star. Um, yeah, that was a big deal for me watching that. And um, that's not, it's not long after that, I went to university. And um, this it was one of the best times of my life because I was in my, in my first year at university and uh, I had some really good friends there and it's a really great university. And um, I would buy a Bob Dylan album every single week on a Friday and I'd go and listen to it for the rest of that week. And uh, every week was like a, a classic album to work through, like Blonde on Blonde and Highway 61 and bringing it all back home. And discovering those albums in such, in such a quick space of time was, um, was just such a joy and, and it kind of really shaped my musical life from there. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that's one of the possibly one of the misconceptions that a lot of people that don't know Bob that well have got where he's got that sense of humour, but people don't think, don't realise that he's got a sense of humour in there. I mean, what other misconceptions can you think of? Uh, the sense of humour thing, I completely agree with. Um, even the, the theme time radio hour, he does a radio show and he's brought it back recently and, and it's just chock full of jokes. It's just, I like that. I like that show. I mean, there, there's lots of dad jokes, but we can forgive him. I mean, he's, he's getting on a bit now, isn't he? Yes. Um, other misconceptions, I think my my least favorite one is Bob Dylan can't sing, which is just uh, I, just because he's not got this um, Mariah Carey type voice. No disrespect to Mariah Carey; she's obviously a great singer, um, but that's not what he's about. He he can carry a, a, a tune definitely, and he's he he can carry a note. Uh, just because he doesn't sound like you know a polished singer doesn't mean he can't sing. It just means he's got a different singing voice. Um, so yeah, that always annoys me. And I think um, in the self-portrait episode I mentioned about, I, I think it was um, maybe it was Blue Moon. I can't remember one of the um, one of the performances in that is is just a great performance. Um, and I feel like that kind of disproves the myth almost that he's he's not a, a good singer. Um, and the other one is that we mentioned before about him uh, kind of just doing the same old folk music again and again. I think he's he's had a, a fascinating uh career sonically it's, it's just always full of of changes and, and always full of new ideas and i think um he kind of doesn't get the credit he deserves for that no and um i think that could be shown if people i mean i'm a big fan of the uh, the traveling wilburys albums mm. and uh, if you listen to his songs on there he's keeping up with all these other people that are his that are his contemporaries yeah, definitely. And I think what we hear from kind of studio sessions from from uh, artists that have worked with him is I don't think he's the most technically gifted musical uh, person I, in that I don't think he always cares about what what key this is in or uh, what chord we should be going to and, and progressions and stuff like that. I think it's it's so natural to him or over time it's become so natural to him that he doesn't almost doesn't care about it. It's, it's just something that other people can worry about. Um, and I think that that kind of, maybe that's what people feel like. It creates a little bit of, of a feeling that he's just not that way musically inclined, but I think he is. I just think it just doesn't matter to him as much as it matters to other artists. No, I, I think with Bob, I, it's more about the, uh, the feeling that he gets in the song. I think that's what he's more on about than he is about any of that, you know, theory or mm. is, is it, is uh, am I playing it? Am I playing a seventh chord, or am I playing this? It's more about what it feels like as the song, and does the song sound right? To yeah, him? totally. And I think you know the fact he he records pretty much all of his albums live, and and they're usually done within two or three takes. A lot of the songs um, that just goes to show that I think he, as you say, just wants to kind of capture almost. It's almost like capturing a performance rather than it being them recording a song and, and going over it painstakingly. Um, and that often makes for a kind of really special sounding song and a song that's kind of captured that magic. Yeah, definitely. So what albums of Bob's do you think stand out and what other albums do you think are overlooked of Bob's catalogue? Um, I mean, all the classics stand out. He's, he's thankfully got really good uh, well, albums that are considered classics that are really good, if that makes any sense, because sometimes, you know, uh, artists have these big selling albums that aren't their best work. Um, but thankfully, Bob's 
all his classic albums, all his big albums are some of his best. Um, I think uh, I, it's, it's hard to say what's overlooked and what's not. Um, I think Oh Mercy, I'm a, I'm a big fan of. That was an album released towards the end of the 80s. I yeah. I always talk about it. Even my wife said the other day, stop talking about that album. Um, <laughs> but I just, I think it's such a brilliant album. It's so good sonically. I love the lyrics. And uh, like we were saying before, it's got a really strong theme. It's kind of a another late night, album it's got a very new orleansy sound without it sounding like a kind of uh like a cheap new orleans kind of rip off um and it's, it's just a clever album as well and, a, and and an album obviously full of good songs so and i'd dan, say I, yeah. sorry go i was on. going i was going to say in daniel lanois uh, soundscapes as well that he creates mm. on there as well oh, i think daniel lanois is a genius that. i i think he's um i think he's the best producer bob's worked with um i think Agreed. Um, it's it's disappointing that he didn't do this latest album because there was a, a very um, a very quick rumor that he might be doing it, um, but that died away quite quickly. Um, but yeah, I think I think he's a genius, Daniel Lanois. I think he, what he brings to the records is um, is is one kind of someone to tell Bob when he's going wrong, which you know you need as an artist. And I think too, he brings just so much cleverness in the studio. And like we said before, I don't think Dylan sometimes just doesn't care about. Uh, particular parts of songs because that's not what interests him maybe it's the lyrics that interest him or the, or the melody or whatever um, but Daniel Lanois for me kind of picks up those bits that Dylan maybe isn't paying attention to and works on them it's almost like a, they're a great duo in the studio um, so yeah I'd say Oh Mercy is, is an overlooked album for, for non-Dylan fans um, I'm, I'm always telling people to listen to that and uh, similarly Time Out of Mind which is another Daniel Lanois produced album yeah. um, I, I think also the the, the albums from this this era just gone uh, modern times i'm a huge fan of that record i love that record i think it's, i love it's, that album i just think it's again it's got another kind of not a strong identity to it and um i love songs like working man's blues uh too and also uh spirit on the water this like you said before there's just something magical about them there, there is I, I think what you're saying though with these recent albums it is it's it's possible that a lot of people who look at Bob Dylan, they look at the older stuff and they think, well, that's the classics. That's where we'll go. Mm. And they, they probably think that like a lot of other artists that are still going from back then that, that don't have that sort of, um, they're not releasing that level or that sort of caliber that they're sort of throwing Bob into there and the, the missing the, they're not even trying to listen to the albums almost. And they're just yeah. throwing it into that same thing. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think um, he's he's thankfully, unlike a lot of artists, had this amazing kind of final act. Well, we assume final act to his career. Um, the only others I can think of that have really had a, an amazing kind of um, run of albums in in their later stage of their career, I think, is someone like Johnny Cash. Um, yeah. But even then, I think the these Dylan albums that we've had over the past 10, 15 years are better than the Johnny Cash uh, American Recordings albums. Um so yeah, I mean it's been it's been great that we've that we've got these really good latter day albums from Bob. And um it's funny, I'm sure I said this on the podcast, but I I think <laughs> most good musicians and most good singer songwriters can can have a a period where they make a run of good albums or good songs. Yep. Whereas I think the the true greats are ones that come back and have big comebacks. And Dylan's career is littered with big comebacks from you know, uh, Oh Mercy in, in the late 80s to the late 90s with Time Out of Mind to this year with um, Rough and Rowdy Ways. I just think like it, it's 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 the old it's the old saying, isn't it? You know, form is temporary and, and, and whatever it is, quality is permanent. That's that's not the right phrase, but you know what I mean? There's, there's If you're good, then you always have it in you. Just sometimes form lets you down. Yeah, it's a bit like if, if you're comparing, comparing them to the Beatles, it'd be compared to they had the period Rubber Soul to Sergeant Peppers, mm. for instance. Definitely, yeah, definitely. What do you, do you have any overlooked albums? I'm curious to to know. I I, I agree with you about both of the uh, Daniel Lanois because I don't think that they're talked about as much as they need to be, or I'm guessing listened to by people as much as they need to be. Because a lot of people they look at the uh, the classic, you know, they, they'll go, oh, that we've got Blood on the Tracks, Highway 61, Blonde on Blonde, Times the Hour Changing, Free Wheeling. Um, but everything else seems to be not placed in that sort of um, sort of area. 
No, yeah, and I, it's funny. I think there's, I think there's better songs on an album like "The Times They Are Changing" say compared to "Oh Mercy." I mean, I don't think "Oh Mercy" yep. has that quality of songs, but I listen to "Oh Mercy" much, much more because I think it's, it, it's for me a, a more interesting album to listen to. Um, so I don't know. Does that make it a better album? I don't know. Probably not. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. But as you say, like it's, it's almost a shame those albums don't get credit. Um, having said that, I mean, uh, "Time Out of Mind" won a Grammy. So, but as you say, I think outside of Dylan's fan base they're almost people don't know they exist that's true you, you find that with all artists you know even going into the j- j- the jazz gen- genre you'd have people listening to uh say miles davis they'll say well we'll do um kind of blue mm. um 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 I don't, I, bit bitches brew or whatever and th- they'll cherry pick albums that are said to be oh they're the best and they won't look at all the others and find that there's that there's hidden gems there that but you just need to pick them out and go and try them out yeah but uh, do you know that's quite I, it's quite nice that bob has that in his career as i say it's it's as i mentioned earlier it's kind of it would be a shame if his big albums weren't that great but thankfully they are but also at the same time we have these kind of gems that almost feel like that they're just for us fans, especially Oh Mercy, because even that's overlooked sometimes with with, with his fan base. Um, so I kind of I quite like that in a way that he has got those albums that maybe people don't know as much about because they almost feel a bit more special. I, I think that as well. So um, you've also got another podcast that you do that's Long Player, yeah, yes. about just albums in general. Is is that? Is that something you came up with as a rest from the <laughs> between doing Bob shows? Yes. Well, I, I'm uh, I'm obsessed with Bob Dylan, but I uh, like lots of other music. And there was there was two episodes I wanted to do. Uh, one was on London Calling because I find that such a fascinating album. Um, you know, it just did so much. I mean, The Clash basically wanted to destroy rock and roll, and they ended up reinventing it. And um, I found the whole process of that album fascinating. Um, and I am a big Oasis fan. I mean, I grew up in the nineties in England. It was almost the law. You had to do it. Um, so I, uh, became fascinated with another album of, of theirs called, um, Standing on the Shoulders of Giants, okay. uh, or Standing on the Shoulder of Giant, actually, I should say, um, it's a misspelling. Um, and that album again was fascinating to me because Oasis had, uh, well, they were the biggest band in the world in many ways when they went to the studio, they'd had a sort of one dud album or one misfire album. And they went to the studio to make this record called standing on the shoulder of giants. And, um, they went in with a big pop producer and some of the songs from it are some of their best work, I think, but others are some of their worst by far. Um, and again, that interested me because, it was almost like they could have created this amazing record and, and all the ingredients was there, but it didn't quite work out. And instead of, it, it was basically the sound of a band trying to move forward, but at the same time being too worried to and, and kind of going back to their roots at the same time. So I found that really interesting and I wanted to do an episode on that. And um, because I had those two albums and I, I, I thought I might as well do a whole series um, based around those two records. So how did you decide on the other albums that you would do? Um, again, it was just albums that one I liked and two that I felt had a story like um, the Led Zeppelin record. The band was sort of a little bit down on their luck when they went to make that album. And then obviously it changed them into um, into one of the biggest bands ever. Um, Joni Mitchell's Blue, I found fascinating. I mean, I, I love that record. I think she's incredible. Um, but I, I, it was a bit like Bob, actually, that the, the, the stories in those songs were so interesting. And there's kind of strange theme running through it about going to Crete and meeting this man there um that i felt like this is such a this is an album that that kind of needs to be taken apart and i just personally wanted to find out more um so yeah i decided to um to ramble on about it for 40 odd minutes <laughs> well it's deserving of rambling on um <laughs> but but then she she is the perfect uh, she's a really good storyteller in her songs J- Joni. I, I, for me, Joni uh, Mitchell is the is probably the only person I'd say that, that um, when I listen to, I get the same feeling as as when I listen to Bob because I think her lyrics are, are brilliant and uh, also you feel like with Bob, especially in, in Bob sixty songs, you feel like that they've they've lived a life and and they've done things and and they've experienced things and now they're telling you about them um, and there's there's kind of no filter there almost, but also at the same time they they wrap them up in this kind of poetry and this this magic that. Um, makes them seem really enticing these stories and these lyrics and um yeah i think especially on that album blue she does that so so well and and also like bob she's she's not stuck to one sound either it, 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 all the all her albums have a different sonic 
um, well, they have a different sound to them. Mm, yeah, definitely. I think um, some of the some slightly weirder, kind of more experimental jazz sounding albums, I, I think, are really great. Um, and even the um, uh, the covers album she released, I think, was it the nineties, maybe the early noughties, both sides now. Um, it was like a very straightforward kind of middle of the road jazz album. Um, it's a little, it's kind of a little bit sentimental at times, but I think it's such a good kind of like pop record. I always listen to that album in sort of winter time in December because I just think it's like a really, it's a really poppy it's it's not trying to be cool it's not trying to be edgy it's just a really good kind of straightforward poppy jazz album of her just doing these songs and um yeah i think she's she's incredibly talented it's it's it's, and she's kind of overlooked at times i guess i think so for definite um but unlike bob she seems to not mind the uh trying to work with the sound and trying to get the she she seems to work longer on on a the recordings than than I, I don't know what I'm trying to say here. No, um, no, I know, I know what you mean. Yeah, I think um, yeah, she seems to be more. I, I could never imagine her going into a studio like Bob and just saying, "Let's play these songs. We're in we're in the live room. Let's record and run through." I don't think she'd ever do that. Um, I think she's much more maybe technical is the right word. I don't know. Um, she seems much more kind of yeah, as you say, like more of a producer than maybe Bob is. Yeah, she seems to be somebody who will quite happily go into a room with the musicians and spend time with them to hone the songs, as opposed to Bob, who I, I've, I've even heard it said before that Bob likes to just go there and see what happens. Yeah, which, um, you know, creates, I think, some really interesting songs um, and also some maybe not so good songs. But I think that's also the reason why we have the this amazing bootleg series that we have from Bob. It's just... Because because he records kind of everything on the fly, there's so much material knocking around, um, which is quite unique. And there's there's not especially these days. There's there's not a lot of artists that are doing that. It's very much we'll rehearse and rehearse and rehearse, then get in the studio and record what we've rehearsed. Um, and I think that sometimes lacks a little bit of magic and, and spontaneity, which you you definitely get on Bob's records. Absolutely. I mean, the spontaneity. If it wasn't for that, you wouldn't have that beautiful um, organ on like a Rolling Stone, where it was just like oh, just just play anything and then he played that organ that's slightly not right yeah but it's perfect for that song and that's the hook yeah i mean uh, that's one of the kind of best moments in in the history of rock and as you say that would just never have happened if he wasn't like that in the studio um i also i read uh, when i was researching the blood on the tracks episodes uh, episodes yeah i read um an article and it was all it was all about how badly recorded that album is and how you can hear uh, the buttons from Bob's coat knocking on the guitars and how you can hear that some of the guitars are slightly out of tune. And, and, and it was kind of really negative about that. And I felt like that's, that's the, for me, that's the kind of beauty of that album. It, it's not, it's not ramshackle in the fact that you can't really hear the songs properly or the, the, the recording quality is poor, but that kind of, that live sound adds to those songs. Cause like I said before, it's, it's almost like, Bob's recounting stories or this narrator's recounting stories and that live feeling gives it a feeling of that they are just talking to you and, and you are maybe you know just sat down hearing their stories rather than it being like a corporate sanitized we've recorded this song sort of affair yeah so did you ever think of doing any other subjects on podcasting when you were coming up with these id these different shows uh, as in artists Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's tough to pick someone who is uh, worthy is not the right word, but but who has the right kind of back catalogue. I don't think you could do a series um, on Oasis, say, because you know it's it, their sounds stay pretty much the same. I, I, and I don't think you could do a series on um, a lots of artists. Maybe you could do a series on Joni Mitchell, and obviously, particularly David Bowie, I think would would really benefit from a series like this on him. Um, but Definitely. one, I, I don't know David Bowie enough. I mean, I'm a fan, but I, I just don't have that kind of um, uh, experience of, of loving him for a long time. Um, so I almost don't feel qualified to do that. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to do another, another one, but um, there is a, st- a slight problem with doing that on podcasting that uh, music rights are a little bit of a grey area. So I think if you if you start doing too many, then people might start asking too many questions. That, that's true. <laughs> so... Um... Do you listen? Oh, first of all, before I ask that, is there an album? This is a this is a bit of a one. Is there an album? <laughs> I'm worried you, now. <laughs> is there an album that you love 
yourself that's almost like a hidden secret gem of an album that you think that more people should listen to? Uh, from from any artist? From any artist, yes. Um, yes, there is one. Um, there's a couple, I guess. Um, there is a, I don't know what we call him, a producer, singer-songwriter uh, called Mr. Hudson. And okay. Mr. Hudson is a... Well, people, I think, will know him because, and bear with me on this, people will know him because um, he, at one stage, was the uh, sort of protege, I guess, of Kanye West. Um, and he worked with Kanye West on on Mr. Hudson's second album, and he worked with Kanye West on his album, 808s and Heartbreak, um, right. and has done a couple of bits since with him. Anyway, he um, is a, a singer and a hip-hop producer, but he produced an album early in his career with his band called The Library. So it's called Mr. Hudson and The Library, and the album is called A Tale of Two Cities. And it's just the most amazing kind of um, album, again, full of stories. Um, it's, it's, it's an indie rock album, I guess, um, but it has like hip hop production on it, um, but kind of indie hip hop production, um, a lot of jazz influences on there. He covers on the streets where you live as well. That's the opening track. Um, and there's a little bit of dance on there. It's just a really clever record. It, it's, it doesn't sound like Home Mercy, but I love it for the same reasons. It's a clever, interesting record and it surprises you and it does things that you don't see coming, especially from like a, at the time he was like a 20 year old English white kid in, in a, um, in an indie rock band and all of a sudden he's kind of having these hip hop beats that pop up in, in like kind of light ways on these indie rock songs. Um, so I love that album. I, I, I think it's just such an incredible record. Um, I'd advise anyone to listen to it. I, not everyone will like it. I, I know that. And that's why it didn't become a big, big record. Um, but personally speaking, I, I think it's just such an incredible record. I think he's super talented. That's, that's interesting because it's almost like a modern, um, a bit like when you were mentioning London Calling by The Clash, where you've got artists that you expect to be one way and then they'll put something in from a different genre entirely because you had The Clash there using samples and you'd have um, like uh, like reggae rhythms in the background of a song, even though they're known as a punk band. So it's the same thing where you've got an hip-hop artist that's using other styles of music and fusing them all together. Yeah, totally, and and again, that's uh, again, it's it like a bit like Oh Mercy. It's, it doesn't it doesn't sound like London Calling, but I completely agree with you. It's I think that's why I like it because it's it's unexpected and um, it's not just your kind of run of the mill indie rock album. Um, and I, I think a little bit of cleverness on albums like that goes a long, long way. Um, and it, it makes for repeated listens. I mean, I, I'm sure you've had it too, but I've I've heard albums that I've really enjoyed on the first three or four listens, and then after a while they get a bit tiresome. And I think. Um, the Mr. Hudson album um, is just an album that you can listen to again and again and again because it's got so many hidden depths, um, a, a lot like Oh Mercy and, and, as you say, a lot like London Calling. Yeah. Right, we better better start winding up again because you've, <laughs> sh- you've got a show soon. Uh, right. So any other podcasts that you listen to personally? Um, I, t- I try not to listen to the other Bob Dylan podcasts, even though I like them a lot, because I think if I listen to them, then it's... I'll start just ripping off their ideas and no one needs that. Um, so I try and, st- I, and I try and steer away from music podcasts in general um, because uh, I just feel like I'll end up just doing what they do. and um, Almost like a busman's holiday as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I witter on enough. I don't need to, need to hear someone else witter on. <laughs> um, but I think the, um, the Dissect podcast, which um, dissects uh, hip hop songs, that's really good. That's a Spotify podcast. Um, and I listen to, I mainly listen to stuff that has no, uh, no kind of relation to music. Um, there's a TV podcast I listen to called The Business, which is all about TV and, and films business. Um, and also there's a, a brilliant um set of documentaries i think there's i think podcast documentaries are quite underrated um there was one on on the clash uh forgive me i can't remember the name i think it's called something like stay free the story of the clash something like that um it's on spotify but um yeah i think that's that's really great and and that's a really brilliant podcast and as i say i think podcast documentaries there's not really a, a big genre at the moment well not particularly that's famous anyway um you get the true the true crime ones obviously but i'm talking about music um but i think there's some there's some great music documentaries as podcasts out there Definitely. So have you got any advice for anybody starting out in podcasting for the first time? Oh, um, just do it. I think just do it. It's a bit like, 
it's a bit like the YouTube thing of just start putting stuff out there because if you if you're not putting stuff out there, then it's it's never going to work. Um, so yeah, regularly upload. I think um, I I'm a bit of a audio geek because that's the medium I've worked in for ten years. Um, so I always think quality does help, but but the listeners don't care <laughs> as, as long as it's listenable. Um, I mean, like this this Zoom quality is fine, um, as, you know, and people have been using that more and more now, so it's become more and more of the norm. Um, but I, I would say if you're going to do it long term, then then think about uh, the quality because there's nothing worse than hearing a really poor quality podcast that has good stuff in it. Um, you know, if it's a dodgy phone line or whatever, that's always quite frustrating. Um, and also, this is such a boring piece of advice, but it's so true. Because it's so, the market's so clogged up now. Um, you kind of have to, there, there kind of has to be a thing that makes you stand out. And, you know, I, I'm not saying my podcast is better than anyone else's or anything like that, because believe me, I know it's not. But the, the point of difference for me is that it's just me kind of delivering, I call them audio essays. Whereas yeah. a lot of the podcasts around music are just two people in a room. Um, which when you get it right is brilliant. And that's the best kind of form for it because it is two people discussing music and, and it's interesting to hear people's opinions. Um, but when you get it wrong, it's quite frustrating because you just get so much kind of rubbish and, and so much kind of waffle. Um, so yeah, so I, I decided to do it on my own as, as like kind of a, as a scripted thing. Um, so my advice would be if you're, if you are going to do something, then maybe try and work out how you can do it new or differently. I know it's a boring piece of advice, but because there's so many podcasts out there, that's the kind of only way you're going to stand out. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, thank you, Ben, for taking part. Thank you. It's been a joy. Thank you for letting me uh, witter on incessantly about Bob Dylan. I don't do it enough. <laughs> I, I've loved talking about Bob Dylan with you. <laughs> oh, anytime, mate. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, the listeners, for for for, for listening. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I mean, get used to, I'll get used to it eventually. <laughs> Thank you very much. Take care and see you on the next uh, episode of Pods Like Us. That was great. Thank you. recording i think oh oh yeah it's come up same recording yep yep okay let's have a look it Um, does that horrible thing at the end where um uh i used zoom for the first time about three or four weeks ago okay and um it at the end it just says all done and it's and it's just gone and you're like well where's the recording and then suddenly it appears in your like little file does it because i've got mine doing it on the cloud so oh right okay that's probably a better idea hopefully (laughs) we'll see to do both (laughs) <laughs> okay, right, let's have a look. Um, hello and welcome to... Uh... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear.